This program is made possible by the support of Delta Dental, Quick Trip, Marshfield Clinic Health System, Wisconsin Counties Association, Wisconsin Hospital Association. Watch Wisconsin Eye on Spectrum Channels 995 and 363 and at wisi.org. Thank you. Oh, this, God, it's, you guys are going to have to forgive us. It's been a while since we've done, we've done this, so we're, I think we're a little rusty. Uh, so welcome, everybody, to the introductory meeting 
of the Speaker's Task Force on Racial Disparities. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping items to go over first, and then we'll, we'll kind of get into the uh, introduction of uh, where we are today, uh, where we're hoping to be at the end of this, and then really what we want to do is give everybody an opportunity to introduce themselves, tell us a little bit about who you are, where you come from, and uh, more, even more importantly, what you hope to, to see come out of this task force. So uh, first, uh, I just want to mention that the meeting is being recorded by Wisconsin Eye at www.wisi.org. So anyone can go to their site and watch us live or view our meetings later. Uh, also, a task force website will be available soon, which will enable the public to keep up with the task force. Uh, hopefully that's something that once we get it up and ready, we'll get out to all the members of the task force and hopefully you'll share it with uh, everybody within your circle so people can uh, keep involved. Uh, we also have set up a television and chairs on the first floor of the rotunda in the Capitol. So if members of the public would like to watch the meeting here, they can do so. Uh, obviously, we're in a little different world with uh, COVID. Um, so everything looks a little bit differently uh, so that's why I appreciate you guys masking up. Uh, feel free when you're speaking to, to remove the mask so people can uh, hear you a little bit better. Um, you're, uh, the, for, the, for those that are at home, uh, thank you for uh, being with us today as well. I uh, we look forward to seeing you all in person at subsequent meetings. Uh, but just so you at home or at your place of business know, uh, your microphones will be muted and will be then be uh, they'll be muted uh, on a regular basis, but then we'll obviously be unmuted when we call on you uh, and it's your turn to speak. Uh, at the end of this, if you have any questions, uh, please just click on the raise your hand uh, thing on your Zoom or your meeting uh, website, and we'll be able to call on you. Um, also. Uh, we ask you to turn on your cameras uh, if they are off when it is your turn. So if you have your camera off for any reason and we call on you to speak, please turn on your camera so people can see you. Um, and again, as I said, if, uh, if you need to speak at a, a different point, use the raised hand option available on your screen and we will go to them, uh, go to you when we can. Uh, so that takes care of the housekeeping stuff. Um, really, I can't tell you how uh, thankful I am that all of you uh, joined in this effort. Um, this is obviously uh, a momentous um, cause that we're all undertaking here uh, with a lot of difficult work ahead of us, a lot of tough conversations that, that we're going to have to have. And the challenges uh, we know are enormous. Uh, we understand that not everybody around the table, uh, probably none of us, will get 100% of what we're looking for through this process. Um, but I really honor your commitment to coming together to try to find those solutions. Um, we have put together an incredible task force. I mean, the, the members of this task force come from a wide variety of different backgrounds, different experiences. Um, and I, I just, I can't tell you again how much I appreciate the fact that you're all willing to do this because it is such important work. A um, little bit about me and uh, then we'll go around and introduce everybody and then we'll come back to the, to the structure of the task force and what we're going to see going forward. Um, my name is Jim Steinecke. I'm a state representative from the 5th Assembly District. also serve as the Assembly's majority leader uh, in this session. Um, I grew up in Milwaukee area, so I uh, grew up in Tosa, uh, lived on the east side uh, for part of my uh, college experience when I was at UWM. I've seen firsthand um, how segregated uh, just the city of Milwaukee is, and that's something that uh, over the course of the 40 or now almost 50 years of my life uh, hasn't changed uh, under both Democrats and Republicans at the state level. Um, there just hasn't been any significant movement in uh, bringing light to the issues in Milwaukee. And I, that's why I wanted to join this task force. And that's why I raised my hand to, to be part of it because um, just during my lifetime, I've seen such a lack of action, a lack of, lack of results. 
in closing some of these racial disparities here in the state. And it's, uh, as, as a white guy coming now living up in Kakana, um, I don't have those same experiences, but I can certainly uh, see the problems where they exist and really want to do my best to help bring people together to find solutions. Because at the end of the day, um, I see my role here uh, as more of a facilitator and someone that hopefully can help in, uh, with the assistance of my legislative colleagues, uh, help bring people together to come together and find consensus around some of these issues so we can move them forward. Um, I, I can think of no bigger task in my legislative career than this one uh, that's at hand right now. So uh, now I, uh, after having moved out of Milwaukee, I moved up to Northeast from Wisconsin, been up there uh, since about 1991, um, and have uh, three kids at home, wife that's a teacher, uh, and just really love representing the area I do. But uh, even being in Northeastern Wisconsin, we, we see some of, the, some of the same problems on a smaller scale that uh, uh, people of color see in uh, Madison and Green, uh, Madison and Milwaukee and other places. So uh, that's where I come from. Um, that's who I am. Um, as far as what I'd like to see out of this task force, it is really, I don't have any uh, concrete ideas or preconceptions about what needs to happen uh, other than we need as Republicans and Democrats and, and independents, we need to come together around some of these serious issues and show people that even in these divisive times, uh, we are able to accomplish uh, good things. We're able to move the ball forward. And that's really what we're asking out of this is to for people to put their partisanship aside, their preconceived notions, um, you know, step outside of your silo and really, you know, uh, come together around a concerted effort to find solutions. So with that, I, I want to turn it over to Representative Stubbs. But before I do, uh, I want to, and I, I think in our discussions with all the task force members, I've, I've said this to just about everybody, but I, I can't be more proud of uh, a co-chair of this task force than having uh, Representative Stubbs uh, join us on this effort. I know it wasn't an easy decision on, on her part, um, but I appreciate it because I know her heart, I know her passion, and I know that she will do everything she can uh, to help in this effort to bring people together to come up with uh, Wisconsin solutions, not just Democrat or Republican solutions, Wisconsin solutions. So with that, I'll turn it over to Representative Stubbs. Thank you. My colleague, Representative Majority Leader Jim Steinecke, good afternoon and welcome to the Speaker's Task Force on Racial Disparities. My name is Representative uh, Sheila Stubbs. I represent the 77th uh, Assembly District, which is right here in Madison. It's comprised of the south and west parts of Madison, the village of Sherwood Hills, and the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Uh, I was elected uh, to this house uh, in 2018. I'm the first African-American to ever be elected uh, to the state legislature from right here in Dane County. Uh, I broke 170 years of history. And what that means is I have no time to waste. It's taken a long time uh, to get here. Uh, I am also a victim of racial profiling from an incident that happened on August the 7th, 2018, right here in Madison, Wisconsin. So I am not just here as a representative. I am also a a Dane County Board Supervisor. I've been in this capacity for 15 years, so I'm an elected official. I'm a pastor, I'm a mom, and I'm a victim. And so this work is critical for me. It is personal for me, and uh, it is work that needs to be done um, immediately. Uh, first, I want to thank Speaker Voss uh, for appointing me to be the co-chair of this vital, important uh, task force, and for my fellow colleague, uh, co-chair and Majority Leader, Jim Steinecke, he and I have always gotten along. We've always been great friends, and there is no other person that I would want to share this real important work with than him, and so I appreciate all that you've done to assist me in this effort. Uh, thank you to Representative Kaylin Haywood and Representative um, Robert Wickey and all of you here today for joining us on the endeavor of real change. Uh, I also want to thank Governor Tony Evers, 
uh, Lieutenant Governor Barnes, uh, the Legislative Black Caucus members, and all of my colleagues for bringing legislation forward uh, to help us make our community, the state of Wisconsin, a better place, not for one, but for all. We would not be here today without the voices of every Wisconsinite calling forward and demanding change. Not tomorrow change, but immediate change right now. I want to thank all of our professional sports and teams, the Milwaukee Bucks, the Milwaukee Brewers, and the Green Bay Packers for bringing awareness around this issue of racial disparity. And every Wisconsinite, yes, that called our phones, that emailed us, that mailed us, um, telling us as legislators, uh, asking that we work together bipartisan and do this real change. We would not be here today without each of you. So again, I want to thank you. I am so proud of the wealth of experience in this room today and those that are joining us by phone and virtual. I know that we would not uh, be here today without you giving your real commitment. I know that you've had to edit schedules. Some of you have had to talk uh, to your bosses, but I appreciate you uh, taking a chance here with us today because I know that, in fact, we have real experts and experience uh, right now in this room and the experience that we need uh, to make real change. The leaders in this room come from a diverse background, including the faith-based community, not-for-profit organizations, uh, experts in law enforcement, uh, public health, education, and so much more. You all have shown your dedication uh, to our community, and I believe that each of you have brought so much knowledge uh, to this space on today. At the Generations of Racial Inequities, we are here today to say enough is enough. The public health crisis of racism is needed to be addressed, and you are leaders who will help us address uh, this moving forward. For far too long, Wisconsin has been the worst place, yes, the worst place to raise a black family. And these are some facts that leads us to this work. Black families are impoverished at a rate of 28.7% compared to 10.3% average. The median black income is only 58% of the median white income. The three-year infant mortality rate for black children is 14.2%, over twice the rate of white children. And black people make up only 38% of the prison population, but only 6% of our state population. This is unacceptable, this is staggering, and these statistics must be changed. It is more clear that we need to have action immediately. In fact, it is an urgency. In fact, it is a crisis. And I'm asking you today to stand with me because this is a call to action. We will start the task force by tackling the use of force issues that have been seen throughout the state of Wisconsin and throughout our nation. On August the 31st, Governor Tony Evers called for a special session on this very issue and proposed nine bills along with members of the Legislative Black Caucus with Lieutenant Governor Barnes that were crafted into consultation with members of our caucus. However, no action was taken and we were left back to square one. This is the only next viable step to work bipartisan. And everyone that I've talked with since special session has demanded that our legislation move forward and take action together. But we cannot do it alone. That is why we need you, the community, to come into your house and help us move this legislation. Racism is a public health crisis, and that's plain and simple. Our lives and the lives of our neighbors and friends are at risk, and as a victim of racial profiling myself, I know firsthand that racism is a polling impact of well-being of a person. If we want to make Wisconsin, and that's a question, if we want to really make Wisconsin a better place for tomorrow, then we need to work toward making Wisconsin a better place for today. Thank you all so much for being here. Thank you all for joining us. And thank you for your commitment to this task force. And it is my honor to introduce my colleague, Representative Robert Wickey. Uh, thank you. Uh, I just, uh, just a short introduction. Uh, my name is Bob Wickey. I represent the 62nd Assembly District, which is Northern Racine County, uh, as well as some parts of the city of Racine. I was born and raised there. Uh, my background is in finance and accounting, and uh, 
I look forward to working with uh, all of my colleagues uh, and the committee members uh, to develop policy which I believe will benefit all Wisconsinites. Uh, I, I served uh, one term on the uh, Racine Unified School District Board of Education uh, where I served as president for two years. Uh, so I've uh, been deeply involved with a number of those issues uh, in my own community as well as I continue to serve on the uh, Academies of Racine Steering Committee which is looking to transform the uh, high school version of uh, education in the community uh, to something that provides uh, opportunities for all. So I believe that uh, my life experiences, that uh, uh, other uh, background that I have will add some value to this committee's work. Uh, I also served on the assembly committees for education, colleges and universities, and jobs in the economy which considered a number of these different topics in different versions. So I look forward to adding value uh, from my experience there. If you've listened to me speak before, one of the things that uh, I often address is the fact that we have a crisis in this state where only 40% of our children across the state can read at grade level. Uh, I've seen firsthand when someone um, is able to have basic skills in reading and math how much further um, it uh, advances their life uh, and how much uh, better prepared they are to take care of uh, opportunities in our state. Uh, un plus, unfortunately, we uh, also have the uh, largest achievement gap uh, of, of racial uh, disparity uh, in the country. Uh, we must find a path to close that gap so that uh, our next generation can take advantage of the opportunities that will be presented uh, to them in this state and that we build a workforce that uh, our employers require because we have a gap right now uh, in the number of uh, jobs that are available and the number of people to fulfill them. Uh, and we need to build that workforce so that our, our economy continues to function at a high level, which will bring uh, benefits to all the people in the state. So with that, uh, I would like to uh, look forward to working with my colleague, uh, Representative Haywood, and we'll uh, let him uh, speak at this time. All right. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Y'all can respond. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, I am State Representative Kaitlin Haywood II. Um, I represent the sensational 16th Assembly District of Wisconsin, uh, which is uh, everything from downtown Milwaukee going up to Capitol Drive, uh, from Humboldt Avenue, 35th Street. Super diverse. I have uh, downtown Marquette. Uh, Pfizer Forum, um, but also have neighborhoods like Johnson Park, Lindsay Heights, Amani, 5206. So it's an extremely diverse district. Um, and when I ran two years ago, a huge part of the reason why I ran is because of the racial disparities and inequalities that existed in our state. When I, so I'm 21, so I'm the youngest one in the uh, state assembly and state senate. Uh, but when I was a kid growing up, um, I used to go to Golden Myer. It's a school uh, close to downtown Milwaukee. Um, I, will, I remember walking up King Drive, uh, coming from school every day. And I would get home, and my grandma, uh, she would be in the house watching the news, and I would see all the crazy things that were happening around the city and around the state happening. Um, and I was young. I was 13, 12, 13, 14. Uh, but that led me to get involved with like Urban Underground and started doing community organizing work because I believe that as a young person, I had to play a crucial role in what was going on because the stuff that happens today will affect my future and my peers. So uh, I was big on getting engaged. And ever since I got, in, got elected and when I ran, uh, I've been big on pushing the needle on economic development. There are so many inequalities uh, for black people and minorities in economic development when it comes to uh, work, the workforce, when it comes to housing, when it comes to transportation, um, when it comes to building generational wealth, and also even education. It's, there's, a, there's a contrast between some of our um, local schools in the city and suburban schools. There's a strong contrast between what's being taught, how it's being taught, what resources are provided, or how money is being spent. Uh, so for me, this task force, was, task force was important because I think what we've all seen this year in 2020. When I ran in 2018, there was an extreme, when I would go to doors, I would realize that there was an extreme lack of people being in the know of what's going on. That is, had to do with the news and the media, but also as electeds, what electeds were doing to reach out to constituents and educate them on what was happening. And for me, I'm like, when I get in, when I get elected, when I become your state rep, I'm going to make sure I'm accessible and that I'm able to inform and educate on what's going on. 
Uh, and began in 2020. We none of us expected this year to go how it did. It was a new decade. We all had bright hopes for what may happen. Uh, but then 2020 came and revealed itself. And it's been a challenging year for all of us, um, dealing with COVID and losing loved ones, dealing with the economic challenges, dealing with the social justice issues. But what I will say for 2020, what it has done is has gotten a good majority of the people engaged. People are standing up, informing themselves, holding their electeds accountable, demanding change, um, demanding accountability. And that's what this year is about. So when this task force came about, uh, I, I, I volunteered. I want to be on it because people are tired of hearing lip service from elected officials in both parties. It's not, it's not a political issue. In both parties saying, oh, there's, we, we admit there's a problem, that something's wrong. But we seem to never be able to come up with a solution on why or how to fix the problem. So I, I, I wanted to get on this task force because I wanted to be in a room with a diverse group of people and experts in the, who are out on the ground every day working in these fields who can bring forth this non-political, just straight, raw fact about what needs to happen and what needs to change. Because we are at a point in history where we cannot afford for change not to happen. We cannot come back around next election cycle and be like, well, politics happened. Like, people aren't, that's not acceptable, it can't happen, it cannot be tolerated. So my hope is with this task force that when we have these conversations, and I want folks to be candid. I want folks to be, we want to have honest conversation about what needs to change and what the realities are. But let's produce actual good, effective policy that brings about that change. I am tired of seeing the inequalities. I'm tired of seeing people dying. I'm tired of it. So I, I hope you all are ready for um, this robust conversation that is going to come up in the next couple, the next couple months. Um, but we have to get work done for the people because that's what they are expecting us to do. And you all have been chosen to be leaders in that conversation and in that movement around the state. So I appreciate you all for volunteering and being a part of this process. Um, my, you we all can talk in these meetings, but please feel free to contact me offline talk as well. We have to get work done. That's what this is about. So thank you all for being a part of it. I look forward to working with you all and my colleagues. Well, thanks, Representative Haywood and Representative Wickey. Uh, I, I hope that what everybody sees from the legislators at the table and from, from their comments, you see that uh, they're here intentionally because they have a heart for the issues. They're reasonable people that are willing to put politics aside and really work towards a common goal. So I, I appreciate all your involvement. But as you'll also notice, this task force is comprised with very few legislators, but mostly of members from our communities throughout the state. That's intentional as well. Um, you know, legislators, whether at the state level or the, at the national level, on a lot of these issues, as my colleagues have mentioned, have really failed to produce results for, for people in communities throughout, throughout our state. So we designed this a little differently than a lot of task forces are. We designed it with fewer legislative members and more people from the public because we truly believe that bringing people together from a wide variety of different backgrounds, along with a small number of legislators to help deliver that message back to our uh, respective caucuses and to the governor gives us the best opportunity to not only pass legislation through the assembly and the Senate, but also get it signed by the governor. Um, it also gives us an opportunity to do things, some things that we just wouldn't be able to do if we didn't have this process. It gives us the opportunity to really educate every corner of the state as to what these issues are, why they exist, and why, why the solutions that the, this task force brings forward are important. And that's critically important in the legislative process because we have 132 members of the legislature and one governor, so 133 total, and all of them with vastly different backgrounds. And all of them come from vastly different communities. And that's why it's, a, it's so important that we get everybody on the same page. So when we do come to the floor with uh, a package of legislation that we certainly hope that it will be have unanimous support in the legislature and move on to the governor to be signed. So that's really the goal of this, and that's why you all are here. Uh, so we want to give everybody an opportunity again to introduce themselves, tell us a little, about, little bit about yourself, where you come from, and what your interest is in this issue, what you hope to see. Uh, so we'll start with our, our virtual members first. Um, I'll start with, uh, yeah, <laughs> thanks, thanks, Bob. Um, we'll start with, uh, what's that? 
Oh, okay. We'll start with uh, Ricardo Diaz from uh, the former directory, director of the United Community Center in Milwaukee. So, Ricardo, the, the floor is yours. Yes. Uh, good afternoon, and, and thank you very much for uh, asking me to participate. I, it's an honor for me to do this. Um, as you said, uh, I'm Ricardo Diaz, uh, former executive director for the last seven year, 17 years at the United Community Center, which is a comprehensive organization serving the Latino community for the last 50 years, serving all the way from uh, six week old to 103 and everything in between. Uh, we run a school, so it was interesting to hear our previous speaker in terms of being involved with the school board. We run one of the largest charter schools in the state of Wisconsin, approximately 1,700 students. So my interest is, and in, in hopefully I can be of help as it relates to education and how we get uh, children of low income and uh, students of color into universities and into basically the jobs of the future. So uh, thank you for the opportunity to allow me to participate. Thanks, Ricardo. Uh, next, we'll go to Ted Knightsky, uh, who is the head of our CESA 6 back in my neck of the woods. Uh, Ted, you ready to go? I am. Can you guys hear me? We got gotcha. you. All right, awesome. Well, first of all, thank you for this great honor. I have, uh, I'm a lifetime Wisconsin resident. I'm born in Milwaukee, educated in Milwaukee. I currently live in Port Washington, but I have dedicated my life to uh, the service of children and I'm a public school educator and very proud of that. Um, what I'm really honored and excited about with this process, so thank you to the representatives uh, and Speaker Voss for bringing this together, is I am so looking forward to finally having a positively uncomfortable conversation about our state. Uh, we live in a great part of the country and everything we do should be reflecting that. And where I'm most excited is I'm most excited as a learner and a teacher, a dad, a husband, and a leader uh, in education. And I, I guess what I'm most looking forward to is that we have the opportunity here to advocate against ignorance, against racism, to create policy and statutes that can shift mindset. And most importantly for me, when I was asked to do this and I was like, yeah, I'm all in, I am all in. He didn't even get finished telling me what it was about, is we are currently living with the greatest generation of young men and women in the history of our country. This little Generation Z group of kids they are gonna grow up more resilient and more, more um, uh, and stronger than any other generation. They are already more accepting. They are already strong advocates. They have already demonstrated their willingness to take risks so that our nation and our state is better. And anything we can do to fuel that so that maintains and sustains is gonna be amazing. What I'm most excited about with this with all of you is my opportunity to learn from you and us from each other through empathy and coming together to do what's best moving forward for the state of Wisconsin. Um, being a person who has just lived my life in Milwaukee, born there in 1971, lived on Capitol Drive, so in the representative's district there when I was a little guy. What's sad for me is that it doesn't look or act much different than it did when I was born in 1971. And it is time for, for us to come together to really make some significant policy changes and to do things that are best for all students um, and that's enough about me. We can learn my background, but I am highly passionate about this work and advocating for um, everybody in the state of Wisconsin to really put an end to a lot of our cyclical issues here around racism and ignorance. So thank you very much for this opportunity. I'm very, very grateful. Thank you, Ted. Uh, next up, we have Patrick Mitch Mitchell, the West Dallas Chief of Police. We have Pat. Okay. Oh, Pat there you are. You weren't allowing me to unmute. <laughs> um, good morning. Thank you for having me. I'm uh, excited to be a proud of this, a member of this task force. Um, as you know, I am the current chief of police in the city of West Dallas, Wisconsin, which is a first tier suburb of Milwaukee, uh, much like some other people that you've heard about. I was born and raised in the city of Milwaukee. Uh, I currently live in Waukesha County, and I've got 35 years in policing for a few different police agencies. I did the first 27 years of my career with the City of Milwaukee Police Department. I then did three years at the Wisconsin Department of Justice, where I got a very good feel for the entire state 
in what different communities in the state are dealing with. And for the last five years, I've been in West Dallas. So certainly law enforcement is going to be a part of the conversation. And I am here as a member of the Wisconsin Chiefs of Police just to give our input and listen to what input is from others and try and come to good outcomes at the end. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, next, we'll have Danny Evans, pastor, former probation parole agent, works with ex-felons on integration. Yes, first I want to honor uh, the speaker and all of the representatives. Thank you for the opportunity to serve on, on this task force. I pastor the only African-American church in Janesville, Wisconsin. I'm currently um, employed with Rock County as a with the Youth Justice. Um, I'm hoping to uh, participate in this task force, looking for uh, racial equity in policing and in criminal criminal justice. Um, but hoping that this task force can um, can bring forth change and do it without villainizing uh, our men and women who work in the local communities as police officers. Uh, I thank you. The latest thing that I was involved in is helping to launch the Lincoln Academy in Beloit, which is a, our charter school here in Beloit, to try and deal with some of those educational uh, inequities for our young people here in Beloit, Wisconsin. I also grew up in the same neighborhood as Ms. Stubbs, and it's an honor to serve on this task force with you, ma'am. Thank you, Pastor Robinson. Thank you. It's so good to always see you. Um, next, we'll have Nate uh, Dreckman, Grant County Sheriff. Hello. Hopefully, everybody can hear me. Yes. Okay. Well, first off, thank you for giving me the opportunity to be on this task force. Uh, for, for me, uh, it's going to be, I know, something I'm going to learn a lot from. Uh, so my name is Nate Dreckman. I'm currently the Grand County Sheriff. I also represent the Badger State Sheriff's Association as the first vice president, uh, which represents all the sheriffs, 72 sheriffs here in, in Wisconsin. Uh, I also I sit on a few committees for the Department of Justice, uh, the School Safety Committee, and the Curriculum Advisory Committee. Uh, been in law enforcement for 25 years. I teach at the Law Enforcement Academy here in, in uh, Southwest Tech here in Grant County. I've done that since 1998. Um, so what do I hope to get from this? I biggest thing is understanding, you know, and, and hopefully give you a perspective of rural law enforcement as well. And uh, my goal has always been is that we in law enforcement can always do better, you know, and I'm here with an open mind. I'm here to gain knowledge and uh, wisdom from the people as, who are part of this task force. And hopefully I can impart some a little bit of knowledge that I might have uh, with some of you as well. So again, thank you so much for having me and I look forward to, to some good positive outcomes out of this task force. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Danilo Cardenas, Milwaukee Police Association. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. <laughs> Um, That's Damon Boatwright. <laughs> yeah. Can we switch the photo? <laughs> Yay! <laughs> so uh, first, I want to thank both uh, the chairman and the and the um, the co-chair and uh, Speaker Voss for allowing me to sit on this historic committee. I'm looking forward to uh, participate and bring some some good conversations here. Um, a little bit about myself. Um, I'm here representing the Milwaukee Police Association. I am also the uh, president of a local chapter of the National Latino uh, Law Enforcement Organization. So we work uh, with the community already as far as that goes. Um, but with the Milwaukee Police Association, we represent almost 1,500 professional police officers. Um, being a professional means that, you know, we're constantly looking for ways to improve our profession. So that's one of the reasons we, we are excited about being on this task force. Um, we're hoping to engage in, in the following topics. And I'll just read this. Um, we want to improve police and community relations. We understand that to be successful in our profession, the community must have trust, must trust that we are working on the best interest of the community as a whole. Um, we want to improve police accountability. Our association and our members do not want bad officers among our ranks. 
Um, we work hard to uh, build the trust of the community, and we recognize that one bad citizen contact or one bad incident can sway the community after years of hard work by the professional police off excuse me, police officers. <clears throat> and finally, we would like to better uh, understand community, better the community understanding of police training and practices. Um, often, some of our tactics when dealing with the public may seem odd to most citizens. And then an, an educational program on why we do certain things, uh, we certain things we do may be helpful in healing some distrust in the community. Uh, again, this list is not all encompassing. It only gives a, a starting point for some conversation. We're excited to work with all of the members on this board and to listen to their concerns and ideals. We look forward to these conversations and the debates that may arise. And we're hopeful that at the end of our conversation, we can have real policy changes that allow better community trust and safety for both citizens and the police. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, we'll have Stephen Rocks from Rice Lake Police Chief. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, <clears throat> just for clarity, my last name is pronounced Rue. Um, the Chief Rue. <laughs> so, anyways, uh, thank you for having me today and uh, having me a part of this task force. Uh, so I'm the current uh, police chief in the city of Rice Lake, which is in the northwest part of the state. Um, I also represent uh, as the second vice president of the Wisconsin Chiefs Association. Uh, Rice Lake is a very rural area and very um, a limited population. But uh, the work that we do in law enforcement across the board and the other representatives in law enforcement have mentioned is that, um, you know, it's, it's tough times. We, we really love what we do. And um, there's, there's oftentimes places where we can improve on that. And having a group like this where we are, um, come from different areas of the state, um, I'm, I'm certainly looking to learn from, from others in this group and hopefully can bring some things back. But I, I would like to also offer some of the things that we've done in our area and, and specifically with our department um, to improve relationships with our community um, to ultimately serve better in our capacities, whether we're in law enforcement, education. Um, so um, again, I, I, I'm honored to be a part of this group and, and look forward to working with you all. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, next, we have Reverend Ye Yoing. I think it's Yang. Is that right? Yao Yang. Yao Yang, pastor um, at the Cross of Wausau. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. So it's a great honor for me to be a part of this task force. Um, and so, in starting here, just a little background about myself is that uh, I am Hmong. And I was uh, born in a refugee camp in Thailand. And when I was seven years old in 1987, I came over here to central Wisconsin. Um, I graduated from high school in 2000 and then went to college down at UW Students Point. And a year later, September 11th happened. And uh, I just wanted to do my part uh, to protect America. And so as a non-citizen, I signed up with the Wisconsin Army National Guard in 2004 to 2005, I was deployed to Iraq. The second soldier from Wisconsin to die in Iraq was actually my squad leader. And so that was uh, just a really life-changing experience for me to, to go overseas to protect our country. When I came back from the war, I ended up graduating from college with my teaching degree. So I've been an educator uh, now for the last 12 years. Currently, I am the Hmong liaison for the DC Everest School District. Um, Five years ago, I also started a non-denominational multi-ethnic church. Uh, so here in Wassa, we have a large Hmong population, um, but as a Hmong individual, uh, I just came to a part of my life where I was ready to go to church with all people, regardless of their skin color. And in Wassa, we just didn't have a multi-ethnic church, and so I started that church. And so we've been um, currently helping uh, just a really disadvantaged uh, population. So currently I go into the Marathon County Jail to do Bible study. We work with uh, addicts, we work with inmates, and uh, I'm also involved with the Joseph Project uh, that stems from down in Milwaukee uh, to help the unemployed to be able to find jobs. Uh, it's because of this that uh, I just found out a great need in our community 
to really help out a really disadvantaged population. A lot of people uh, are just dealing with uh, this issue of addiction. And here in central Wisconsin, we just don't have a long-term uh, residential facility that's faith-based. And so I'm currently the executive director of the Gospel TLC, which is a transformational living center. We, what we want to do is to be able to give people the long-term hope that they will need for individuals that are addicted and or broken. So I'm just really honored to be a part of this task force. What I'm looking forward to is being able to work with uh, all of these wonderful professionals throughout the entire state so that we can create policies uh, to address disparities, uh, inequality, and most passionate for me to be able to just raise the quality of life with individuals that are living in poverty. And I can relate to that because coming here to the United States as a refugee, a big portion of my life was living in poverty. And so that's just really near and dear to, to me. Thank you. Next, we'll have Pastor Jerome Smith uh, for the Joseph Project Leader. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. We're trying to get that video to show. It keeps saying that I'm I'm locked out by the host. That's okay. It's okay, Pastor. All right. I'm Jerome Smith, Senior, the pastor and founder of the Greater Praise Church of God in Christ, located here in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Also, the president and CEO of a wonderful organization called the Joseph Project. I'm excited to be a part of this group. And I want to thank all of you all who recommended me and accepted me in this group. And I'm looking forward to working with each and every last one of you all. I, I too, have been a victim of police profile, racial profiling. So I understand and I know how it feels. I worked with, uh, over the last five years, God has blessed us to put over 520 people to work who ordinarily wouldn't have been accepted by society. So we can relate to what's going on out here. And we want to see a change. We want to see a difference. We want to be able to see a safer, more prosperous Wisconsin where all of us are able to come together as a people, not black people, not brown people, not white people, but as a people, because God is one God and he doesn't have a respect to person. And I believe together we can do just that. We can push, push change out there and make things happen. Please forgive me, I'm a little weak today. I had dialysis today and I'm just coming from dialysis. So please forgive me, I'm a little weak. But as I said in the beginning, thank you all for accepting me in this task force. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you so much, Pastor Smith. Uh, we have Tahisi Hill, Oneida Nation Chair. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, again, I'd just like to express my thank yous to being able to participate on the Speaker's Task Force and for all the participants. Uh, my name is Dehasi Hill, Chairman for Oneida Nation. I uh, was born and raised here on the Oneida Reservation, which is uh, northeastern Wisconsin. The city of Green Bay uh, comes partially onto the reservation. Um, I am a, a, a son. I am. I have four younger brothers. So I'm the eldest of five boys that my parents raised, and um, uh, I'm married. Me and my wife have a blended family of eight children and. Uh, 14 grandchildren and so uh, have a quite large family and uh, being uh, Native American uh, I uh, also experience a lot of the different disparities um, throughout different parts of the state as I traveled around I've, but I've lived here in northeast Wisconsin my entire life and you know I just like the the things that I would like to see you know worked on as mentioned by several of the other participants is you know really make affecting change in, in our communities and in the state to have a better quality of life for all of the citizens of the state of Wisconsin. And in particular, I obviously being Oneida would be also representing uh, issues that, you know, many Native American uh, individuals and tribes face, you know, across the state with different racial issues that continue to uh, uh, be an issue for us and that uh, we continue to fight on a daily basis and so you know any opportunity that I can to help educate and share our story and participate in these discussions to uh, have better education and uh, better policing of our communities and access uh, to 
you know, jobs and, and kind of eliminating those disparities in our communities as well. You know, I'll, I'll take every opportunity that I can to participate. So again, I would just like to thank uh, uh, for being a part of the speakers task force and, and uh, being able to sit on this uh, task force with all the participants. And I look forward to the conversation going forward. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you, Tahasi. It's good to see you. Uh, next up, we'll have Tony Gonzalez, the founder and co-chair of Toward One Wausau. He's not in. Okay. We'll, uh, we'll just skip Tony for now. Hopefully he'll come back in. Uh, so next up would be Eve Hall from the Milwaukee Urban League. Hello. Uh-oh. Can you hear me? Yep, we got you, Hello. Eve. There you are. Yes. <laughs> Hi, yes. Dr. Eve Hall, President and CEO of the Milwaukee Urban League, an organization that has been around since 1919 on a local level and since 1910 on a national level. We were started to meet the needs of the five to seven million African Americans who migrated from the South to the North. And we were the organization that embraced that movement, embraced individuals and families um, that were African Americans starting a new way of life. We support in terms of education, employment, health, housing, entrepreneurial support, equity, equality um, has always been at our very core of everything that we have done. So I really thank you, Representative Steineke and stuff, for having me as part of this um, important task force. And I just salute all of you that have agreed to join because this is that moment in history that is so critical to the state. And we are one of the most divided states in this country in terms of race. Um, and I, I, I am hoping as I think about what will happen over the course of these several months is that we can become more cohesive as a state. So that quite frankly, as African Americans, there's not a fear or concern of traveling throughout the state and having to be concerned about whether we are welcomed or not and whether we're going to be pulled over or not. And it all begins with building relationships at the level that we're speaking of. I grew up in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I have lived in Florida. I've lived in DC um, and traveled uh, all over this country. And there's so much that I believe we can do collaboratively as we understand that we are interdependent. We can't run away from each other. Um, one's success is the success for all. And when we are all living a quality of life and when we are all living without fear, it can be an incredible society because we all want to have a just society. Um, several things that have been mentioned, um, the reading levels, I'm a former teacher, so we know that reading is the core. So that reading level um, that was talked about is of, of great concern to me, especially as we have the racial gaps in education. That prison population is just unacceptable, 38% to 6%. There is something wrong with that. Um, you know, the continued fear that families and especially um, African American men have to feel in today's world, we cannot continue that. So, you know, those hard conversations, I believe, can be had by this task force. Um, and just, I think, the whole divisiveness that was mentioned earlier um, that is just incredible in the country. We have got to cut through this. And so I applaud this effort in terms of putting partisan and politics aside and understanding that we all bleed red and we all need each other in this state. And let's move away from being the worst and the last. And let's be that core group that can truly move this state in another direction. My background is nonprofit education and government. We have had nothing to those who have had everything. And so let's just, I believe, be humbled as individuals on this task force and take this role seriously, which I believe we all do. So thank you for allowing me to be part of today's task force. Thank you, Dr. Hall. Uh, we have Tony Gonzalez back in the queue, I believe. So we'll go to Tony. 
Yes, uh, good afternoon and uh, welcome to everybody. And it's really nice to get to see so many people interested in the welfare of our state. And I want to thank uh, everybody there in the, in the assembly room, um, in particular, uh, Patrick Snyder, my representative right here that uh, kind of um, made me aware of the, what's going on right here. Uh, my name is Tony Gonzalez. I live here in North Central Wisconsin in Wausau. Uh, not an area that is tremendously uh, diverse at this time, but that it's grown in diversity. And uh, <clears throat> I have discovered that instead of complaining, I think the best way is to join in to find solutions uh, to the problems that we have in, in, in our area and in our state. Uh, I have uh, joined many different groups here in the Arwas area that are focused about diversity, uh, about inclusion, and uh, in particular, you know, this situation with the police, I think that there is a lot of work that uh, not only the police has to do, but also the community, and in particular the Hispanic community that I work with, um, needs to learn uh, more about how to uh, improve this relationship. I think it's a two-way avenue. We try to always tackle it from one side, and it takes two to tangle, like we said, and I think that uh, uh, we need both sides to work together. I grew up in Colombia, South America, and I grew up in the time where uh, there was a lot of problems with narco uh, terrorism. Um, <clears throat> as a matter of fact, my, my godfather, is, uh, was the commander of the Colombian police, uh, General Luis Ernesto Giliver, and he uh, had to deal with the Cali cartel and the uh, Medellin cartel. And uh, there was a great improvement to the Colombian police, and uh, it had to do mostly with um, uh, community policing that I believe needs to return. I always go back to this Norman Rockwell uh, drawing, <laughs> and I want to go back to this right here, not to the feeling that people have right there and uh, that, that drawing to me really means a lot and I have had it for a couple of years and being a part of this task force now has given more meaning to that drawing right there because um, we, we need to improve the relationships. We need to work from both sides. Uh, <clears throat> as far as I'm concerned, you know, my, my contact and my communication is with the Hispanic community that is growing here in North Central Wisconsin. But uh, there is much to share. There is much to work with. Um, I think, you know, that uh, we've gone so far to the extremes that nobody even knows what compromises any longer. So I am looking forward to working with this task force and with everybody that is involved to make sure that uh, we start working from the middle and getting everybody involved and making Wisconsin the great state that it is. I know so many people of so many different races and, and uh, backgrounds and I do believe that we have great people here. All we need to do is start the conversation and open our hearts, leave biases on the side, and uh, find those solutions that are at hand. And uh, the thing that attracted me the most about this task force is the word bipartisan, uh, almost something that we don't hear nowadays. So I am glad that that word is in the front of this whole uh, task force and that we're going to work as so to uh, bring solutions to our state. Thank you very much for having me here with you. Thanks, Tony. Next, we'll go, uh, next up will be Damon Boatwright from uh, SSM Health. Thank you, and good afternoon, uh, everyone. I am also truly honored and humbled to be part of the speaker's task force today. Uh, it's incredibly important, and it's been inspiring to see task force members from a variety of different industries, community groups, differing political background. So uh, Mr. Chairman and Madam Chairwoman, kudos uh, to you uh, in the selection committee for picking this group. Um, I represent a Catholic organization, SSM of Wisconsin, and we have multiple hospitals and clinics, nursing homes, a health plan, as well as a pharmacy benefit plan spread out through South Central Wisconsin, many of which are rural areas. And as one who personally is Catholic, uh, running a Catholic organization, we have a fundamental commitment to honoring the human dignity of every single person from conception to natural death is our belief. And morally, we feel that there's a common good around certain values, respect, compassion, and community. 
So it's my hope that the work of the Speakers Task Force can spread these values to the equitable care and service of all Wisconsinites, regardless of the community they live in and or the circumstances in which they might have been born into. I'm honored to represent healthcare because many of the societal factors at play in society ultimately impact the health of our communities and the overall wellness of community members. I fundamentally believe that better economic opportunities, stable, affordable, safe housing, quality education, better air, water quality, access to healthy foods, all of these things can make significant progress and improve conditions for at-risk individuals or populations in Wisconsin. Finding and recommending common sense and pragmatic solutions to what causes the disparities and equities will go a lot farther, in my opinion, in preventing the issues that plague and divide our society than by focusing singularly on the reactionary activities generated through the passion of the moment. So thank you again uh, for allowing me to serve. And I'll end sort of with this quote. Um, we all know that a rising tide raises all boats, unless, of course, some boats are tied to heavy and long anchors weighing them down. So my hope is anchor up everyone and god bless wisconsin along the way thanks damon uh next up we have linda fair uh, academic advisor for black hawk technical college hello i'm linda fair um as he stated academic advisor at black hawk technical college a native of beloit um been in the rock county area majority of my life i'm just pleased and grateful to be a part of this task force as I hope to be a voice for those who are voiceless. And also I'm a firm believer if you're not part of the solution, you're just as much a part of the problem. I'm here to um, represent students and staff from Blackhawk Technical College, um, community members from the Beloit and Janesville area, and anyone in between. So again, I'm thankful and grateful and I'm looking forward to working with all of you on this e endeavor. Thank you. Thanks, Linda. Uh, I think that wraps up everybody that was virtual. So uh, thank you all for that uh, joined us virtually. Uh, please stick around to hear from the rest of the folks. Uh, but now we'll transfer over to everybody that's in person. So we'll start off with my new friend, Pam Holmes. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Pamela Holmes. I am a retired Milwaukee Police Sergeant. I worked with Milwaukee Police Department for 26 years. I'm also currently the president of the National Black Police Association, Wisconsin chapter. So before I retired, my passion was people. It always has been people being out there involved in, in the community. Um, early on in my career, I'll just give you a, a brief stint. It was, you know, I'd never experienced racism. I grew up in a 53206 zip code, and I graduated from North Division High School in 1986, and Val Phillips and Arthur Jones and Howard Fuller and good more. These are all graduates of North Division. So my passion and my goal one day was to be a police chief. And from seeing Arthur Jones' uh, picture up there um, in the schools. And so I'll bring you up until like where we are right now. It's like growing up in a 53206, we didn't experience racism. My mother, we were well-rounded individual kids. I mean, we love black, white, Asian, Hispanic. It didn't matter. I did not experience sexism and racism until I joined the Milwaukee Police Department, and I was victim of that. And so it was either conform, quit, or you're just going to be the outsider. I was that outsider. I didn't quit, and I was not going to conform to standards. So I continued on. I transferred from, I worked in Districts 3, 4, 5, 7, and uh, Avenues West. And in all of those uh, transfers from district to district is trying to find my niche. Where did I fit in at? And District 5 was the location that's on 4th and Locust. And this is where I started going to police conferences outside of Milwaukee. Milwaukee Police Department trained me how to be an officer, but they didn't give me the skills to how to mediate and negotiate and talk and meet with people. And that training came from when I started going to the National Black Police Association conferences, whether it was in Florida or Atlanta or California. And I met officers from all around the world, and they would just bring ideas about what worked in their community in trying to bridge the gap between law enforcement and the community. That's kind of what I did, and I started going every year, and I would come back, and I would try different things within the district where I worked at. So I wound up taking the test and got promoted and became a sergeant in 2000, and I was a sergeant up until I retired in 2017. 
And the last thing I did before I retired was I put on this event called World Peace with, in Sherman Park. Right after the 2016 riots, the officer-involved shooting that happened in 2016, I brought people together with law enforcement officers. And we had dialogue on what to do and stop by police and knowing your rights and keeping our kids safe from human trafficking and bullying and record expungement. It was all the things that people wouldn't expect law enforcement to do. And we did that with the community. I've met so many people uh, in my travels and networking and, and stakeholders and um, being a part of that where we had a law enforcement officer well, as well as someone within the community that specialized in human trafficking. And we had dialogue. And all of those things were great and good. And, but within the police department, they didn't want to see it continue. You know what I'm saying? So it was kind of, it was, um, it was like, if you want to do this, you're going to do this on your own time. We're not paying you to do it anymore. So I, I retired, and I'm thankful I was able to retire. I had the time on to retire after 26 years because I still, we need, I still believe that we as law enforcement officers have to be involved with the community in a positive capacity. That is the only way that we're going to survive. It's not us against them. It should never be. It should never have been. There are good people. There are bad people. There are good cops. There are bad cops. And we have to be able to work together. You'll find officers will not speak up unless they have that time to retire. Because, you know, just like you see across the world, United States, you know, you see these your cops getting retired. I mean, getting fired for speaking out about what's going on. So how do we change that? How, we do, how do we give the young officer a voice who actually wants to help, who actually wants to say something, but they are afraid to? And so one of the things I did was after um, the George Floyd incident is I got all these retired officers together and sat down and said, we got to do something. We have to get reinvolved because we're retired. We have a voice. We can speak up for the officers that are there. We kind of know what's going on. We were there for 26, 32 years. So why not stand up and say something? So we put together uh, Fred Royal and um, the Urban League, um, the NAACP, and all of them came together in the World Outreach Church on, uh, I believe it was June 6th. And we've been meeting ever since then, and Orlando Owens was a blessing sent to us uh, because he got us in touch with Speaker Voss, who started listening to the ideas that we had, talking about the 21st century model of policing, which was already in the works, but he wanted to hear it worked out in detail. So we spoke on police reform and fair housing and education and mental health and health. We, you know, we divided health up and made it mental health because officers go through mental health issues as well. So we have to not just be looking at the community. Let's also look at law enforcement within that also because, you know, you're expecting a cop to be a cop and wear the uniform and they're supposed to show up, but these guys have feelings and emotions as well. They got personal issues going on, whether it's marriages or they got bad kids or good kids or whatever. And how do they deal with that at the same time as being law enforcement officers? So I would like to thank you for having me here and being a voice in the community. Thank you. Thanks, Pam. Uh, next, we'll go to Jim Palmer from the Wisconsin Professional Police Association. Good afternoon. Uh, first, I want to, like others have, uh, thank Speaker Voss for convening this body and uh, allowing me uh, the opportunity to, uh, to serve on it. I appreciate uh, the, the, the public dialogue that uh, we're going to help facilitate. Um, I also want to thank uh, especially uh, the co-chairs of this body, the, uh, Representative Steinecke and Stubbs, for your leadership and willingness to take this on. You look around the country, uh, there aren't many lawmakers, policymakers at any level uh, that are uh, brave enough and willing to, to undertake such an effort. So I appreciate, uh, appreciate your leadership. Um, I also want to say I express my appreciation for all of you. Um, some of you I know and others I don't, uh, but I am grateful for the opportunity to, to learn from you. Um, and uh, you know, I'm excited about the exchange of, of ideas and information that I expect that we'll have. Um, a little bit about me. Uh, I am a, a native of Wausau. Uh, went to undergrad at UW-Madison and law school at Valparaiso University. Um, I am a lawyer. Don't hold that against me. Mm -hmm. um, while I have the haircut that is common to the profession, I myself have never served uh, as a law enforcement officer. I have uh, been with the Wisconsin Professional Police Association for the last uh, well, nearly 20 years now. Uh, for those of you who may not be familiar with the WPPA, we are the state's largest law enforcement group. We represent nearly 10,000 members from over 300 local association affiliates. Um, and we're a full-service organization. We bargain their contracts. Uh, we represent them uh, when they're under disciplinary scrutiny. And we also uh, 
assist them uh, following their involvement in a critical incident, such as an officer-involved shooting. And I personally have represented uh, quite a few officers in that regard. And so I can speak to some of the issues that, that you mentioned, uh, Ms. Holmes, about uh, uh, you know, what the officers' feelings and, 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 and things of that nature and how, how they're impacted by this as well, because I think that is a, an important component. Um, I'm on the board of directors for a number of groups, such as the National Association of Police Organizations, uh, the Wisconsin Law Enforcement Accreditation Group, and the National Law Enforcement Officers Memorial. Um, so I, I think I have uh, some good experience uh, that I can hopefully bring to the table. Um, the, uh, the WPPA, I think, has a proud progressive history of uh, being different in terms of how we approach these issues and trying to be assertive and more proactive. Um, uh, we played a meaningful role and were uh, helped champion along with citizen advocates uh, uh, Wisconsin's uh, policing reform in 2014. We became the first state in the nation to mandate independent investigations of officer-involved shootings. And our, our organization, um, uh, we're grateful to play a, a role in that. Um, we're the only law enforcement group in the country, if you can believe it, that conducts an annual statewide poll uh, to gauge the public perception on a wide variety of issues re related to criminal justice and policing. And we use those poll results as a, a, a platform or a foundation to go around the state and, again, play a more assertive role in, that, in the public discourse that surrounds policing in this country and in this state. Um, for, and we've been doing that for the last eight years. Uh, during that same time, we're also the only organization in the state that is uh, consistently collected data on, officer, on the officer-involved shootings that occur in Wisconsin, and we share that publicly because we believe a, an effective uh, public dialogue is an informed one. Um, you know, following the, the, the death of, of George Floyd, uh, I began having a series of conversations uh, with people w both within the law enforcement community and, and outside of it. And... Um, the idea was to put together, you know, a set of ideas and proposals, not by any means to say that we have it all figured out, but, you know, to c basically perpetuate our, our history of being progressive. Um, again, try and play a meaningful and effective uh, and sensitive role in, in the, this public discourse. And uh, last month we put out, a, I think, the most comprehensive series of police reforms by any police group in the country uh, called the Blueprint for Change, a blueprint, not the blueprint. Um, and the subtitle is Opportunities to Evolve Policing in America. And we have um, uh, proposals that deal with training and standards, oversight and accountability, community engagement and innovation, and officer wellness. Um, and uh, so I, I, I'm sure these issues and many others uh, will, will be a part of this, this group's discussion. Uh, and I look forward to that. Um, as I think we've all seen over the last several months, and it, I think it's been growing for the last several years, the public discourse that surrounds policing has become more, more and more polarizing. And it seems you either have to support the police or support the cause for social justice. And I think that's a false choice. And I think this body will help uh, demonstrate that. And I think it can be a, a model for the nation. Um, I think Wisconsin is blessed in many regards, its law enforcement community in particular, and I think we are ahead of the curve in many respects. But I also believe we can improve. And I always think that certainly it's been our position that as a state's largest law enforcement group, we have to be uh, open to exploring ways to improve and to grow and strengthen not only how our members serve their communities, but uh, to strengthen the relationship between our members and the communities they serve. And I also agree that we have to act. Um, I, don't, I don't think the, the status quo is sustainable any longer. Um, you know, if, if we fail to be responsive to the, the cries for change, um, we shouldn't be surprised uh, when the, the public reaction following the next officer-involved incident in this state or somewhere else in the country uh, grows more severe. Um, but I am very optimistic and excited about the potential that this group has. Uh, someone else, one of the former speakers, uh, I was going to mention the rising tide that lifts all boats. Uh, so that's already been taken. Um, but I do believe that this body has every potential uh, to be that tide uh, for the people of this state and to set a model for the rest of the country. So I I'm uh, glad to be here, and I look forward to working with all of you. Thank you.
Thanks, Jim. Uh, next, we'll go to Tori Lowe, co-founder and CEO of Justice of Wisconsin. Tori. For us. There you go. Um, I don't know if y'all heard me, but I'd like to thank all of the reps, all of the community members, all the community leaders for being a part of this task force. I'm, I, I'm familiar with some of you, and to the ones that I'm not familiar with, I would love to get to know you and on a more personal level. And but um, about me, I'm, I'm definitely um, excited. I'm rarely excited. <laughs> But I'm definitely excited about the opportunity to make change in the state of Wisconsin. And I can see a group of people here that have a not an easy task in front of them, but it's actually something where I can say, hey, let's try this. Because if we have an opportunity to make change and we're here as leaders in community, this is our obligation. This is where we have to be. This is the time to be here. So I understand that. When it comes to me, I'm a victim of a hate crime. Something happened to me in Minnesota. I don't want to elaborate on it because it was so much I had to bear. Um, I'm a victim of a hate crime. I was at work, and some people decided to try to tie me up and throw me in a hog grinder one night. In 2005 in Minnesota, in Worthington, Minnesota. I was a parts case manager. I was working third shift. And that night changed my life. And it took me four years to go to federal court. And we won this federal court case. And I walked out of this federal courtroom like, whoa, like what just happened? And I came home to Milwaukee. And I could not tell people everything that took place over a period of four or five years and I just started getting to work in the community and a guy came to me and said hey Tori we got a problem I said what's the problem he said an officer took down my pants and stuck his hand in my anal cavity I said what he said yeah this is what happened I said I didn't believe him he said he he said I said well let's get a bunch of people together and see what's going on so he it was like 30 of them we met at this church and it was 30 black males that came to this church and said that they were illegally strip searched mm. by police. And this was back in 2011. So I started my first lawsuit. I organized my first lawsuit against the city of Milwaukee. And from there, I've organized 63 lawsuits across the state in 10 years against police brutality against human rights violations and I get to 2020 COVID-19 comes everybody's it's still a lot going on 10 years later we're still not making any progress you know you see the Jacob Blake you see Joel Acevedo you see Alvin Cole, you see all these things on the news and you have this separation of police and citizens fighting against each other. And you say, what can we do to stop it? And then you say, what can I do to stop it? And so you get out in the community and you see the disparities. Wisconsin, like we heard in this already, Wisconsin leads in the worst statistics when it comes to African Americans across the board. I, I even searched for one positive statistic. I said, okay, we got plenty of negative statistics, but where are the positive statistics on African Americans in the state of Wisconsin? And I couldn't find one, so if anybody know one, just let me know because I'm looking for it. This is where we're at. I heard uh, Jim say that uh, the police are being progressive. And I would like to say that I would love to talk to you a little bit more about it you know, on some kind of personal level or see what, what you're talking about. But in my community, they don't trust the police. And I have been a bridge between the police and the people many times, but yet I still haven't given 
my services to the idea because I don't want to lose the trust that I built over 10 years. So it's hard for us to come together and say we're going to work together when I leave you and an officer shoots a black male or something happens that I have to say, hey, how can we make this work? We have to start passing legislation. And this is why I'm here because when I leave here, I got to go back to a community where a, third, a four-year-old girl was sexually assaulted and has an STD. And we have to round up the people who did it. And I have to work with the police to do it. But I also have to go to a family who, where an officer have killed their loved one. And I have to work with that family to get the officer who did that. So I'm in constant conflict as a community leader on what to do, and I'm, I'm gotta, I gotta say that this is the right thing to do, regardless if it's a police officer or a, a violent incident where somebody have killed somebody, somebody's on the run. I have to make these decisions every day. So when I get here to this task force, I'm praying and hoping that this is the beginning of real change where I can look people in the face and say, this is something that can change the things that are happening in the state of Wisconsin. And I'm hoping that each one of us sitting here feel that same way because it has to start somewhere. And I'm hoping it starts now. God bless you. Thank you, Tori. Uh, next, we'll go to Lieutenant Wayne Strong, Madison Police Department, retired. No. I think it's that one right there. Try that button. Testing. Thank yes. you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, it's a it's a real honor to be here, and I'm I'm so grateful and honored to be a part of this very impressive body. Uh, I was looking at the names, and I'm really hopeful that we can really do something meaningful meaningful here, and I'm I'm really looking forward to that. Um, I am uh, Wayne Strong. I'm a retired Madison Police Lieutenant. I um, worked for the Madison Police Department from 1989 to 2013, and I retired. Um, and since then, I've been working uh, for a number of different uh, organizations, uh, from uh, businesses to nonprofits. I currently work for a nonprofit right now that's called the National Council on Crime and Delinquency. I'm a program associate there, and some of the work that I'm currently doing revolves around recidivism. And we know that, for one thing, Wisconsin uh, has one of the highest rates of recidivism uh, disparities uh, in the nation. And so um, that's the work I'm doing now. A little bit more personal level about me, I was, uh, I'm was i a native of Racine, Wisconsin. Shout out to Rep. Whitkey over there. Uh, I think you're also a blue gold, right? Yes, right. I went to Eau Claire as well. Um, I got my degree there in the early 80s for, uh, in criminal justice. And I don't know if you guys recall, but in the early 80s, it was a very difficult time back then. Jobs were really tough. It was the trickle-down theory of economics back then. And there were no jobs trickling down to me. So finally, I was able to find work in a private psychiatric hospital in Milwaukee called St. Mary's Hill in the early, in about 84. And then from there, I got my first job in law enforcement with the Hennepin County Sheriff's Office in uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota. And that was where I got my first glimpse of the Minneapolis Police Department. And quite frankly, um, watching the video of George Floyd um, and the officer kneeling on his neck brought back some very painful memories for me. Because when I first started working in the jail, um, it took me a while to get used to the, to the level of violence, to the brutality that was suffered by so many people, particularly black and brown people, that were brought into the Hennepin County Jail by the Minneapolis Police Department. And so leaving there in 89 and coming to Madison was, was quite a change. Um, and coming to Madison, it was a completely different culture. And I think that's certainly one of the things that, that as we're talking about, 
reforming police. We need to talk about police culture because that is huge. Um, we need to talk about accountability. We need to talk about transparency. And I can tell you, as uh, as a police officer for 24 years, you know, I saw firsthand um, how so many of, of, of black and brown children end up in our criminal justice system, end up uh, starting out with um, our school suspensions, right? We have some very high rates of school suspensions across the state among African-American students. Um, I think in Racine, the last number I saw was like 66%. Uh, Madison is about half that and rising. So this is something that's that's very, I'm very passionate about. I think we need to do this because if the kids that are ending up um, that aren't making it in our educational system are ending up in our juvenile mm -hmm. and ultimately our criminal justice systems. And that has to change. You can call it the school to prison pipeline. I think there's some real intervention that needs to be made there. I think it's imperative that we, the work that we're doing with this body addresses those issues of disparities in education in terms of, of um, suspension rates, expulsion rates, dropout rates, um, and making sure that we're increasing our rates of graduation. Because I think that's where really where the rubber meets the road, keeping kids engaged, keeping them in school, and making sure that there's a path to success for them. And that's one of the reasons why, for three times now, <laughs> I've run for the Madison School Board. And uh, someone was just talking to me on the way in here about running a fourth time, and I'm not quite there yet, but we'll see. <laughs> but uh, I do believe, though, that um, there is much work to be done, and I think that uh, part of what we see, what we're seeing now, is is, is I think that the, the George Floyd incident has really brought so much of this out, and and really brought to light some of the huge disparities that uh, exist uh, in our criminal justice as well as our educational system. And um, I've been recently meeting with a group of retired officers as well, Sergeant Holmes, to to address some of those issues, and, and we were kind of talking about you know, the fact that. In the culture of policing, so many officers of color don't want to speak out. We recently ended our SRO contract here. I was one of the first EROs back then to work in the Madison School District, and that was a great opportunity for me. I was really excited to be able to go into the schools as a, as a black male police officer working with young black males in particularly. Um, and so seeing the program come to an end was, was, was sort of uh, a real, um, I was not very pleased about it, but I understand, given the times that we're in right now, where people are coming from. And, and again, going back to the issue of accountability and transparency, I think those things are important, community involvement. I've been very fortunate for the past 25 years to be a part of a youth organization here in Madison called the Southside Raiders Football and Cheerleading Program, um, working with young, young people, serving as mentors. Uh, those things are important. That community engagement piece is so important. And so working with this body and making sure that we're uh, tackling the tough issues that we need to tackle in terms of race, um, getting at the culture of policing, and making sure that every voice is heard so that people don't feel like if they speak out, they're going to be ostracized or they're going to be somehow uh, mitigated. Uh, I think it's imperative that we, uh, that we um, are allowing those voices to speak and be heard so that we can make some real meaningful progress and change in our criminal justice as well as our educational systems. So thank you. Thank you, Lieutenant Strong. Uh, next we'll have Calvin Barrett, Madison College Law Enforcement Instructor. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Speaker Voss, and thank you all the, the representatives here for this opportunity. Thank you for all of the community members, uh, community leaders that are here at this task force. My name is Calvin Barrett, and I'm an instructor at Madison College. Uh, I am a law enforcement officer. Um, I'm an educator, um, and I'm here uh, to help and to create a blueprint for the rest of the world to follow. We have a great opportunity right now to do something special, and the whole world is watching. And I look forward to the opportunities to create uh, discussions, have courageous conversations, and to be in a vulnerable position as a law enforcement officer and an educator to look at what we're doing and to, to really critique what we're doing and how we're doing it. We can't expect to get different outcomes without changing the process. And I look forward to doing that with each and every one of you. Thank you for your time. Thank you for this opportunity. And I look forward to working with each and every one of you. Thank you. Thank you, Instructor Barrett. Next, we have Reverend Marcus Allen, pastor at Mount Zion Baptist Church here in Madison. 
Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Reverend Dr. Marcus Allen. I am the pastor of Mount Zion Baptist Church. I am also um, the president of the African American Council of Churches, which serves uh, over 20 churches in the Dane County area. Um, I was born in Mississippi, raised in Milwaukee, um, and then at the age of 19, I joined the United States Army, served in the United States Army for 10 and a half years. I went to Iraq twice and once to Afghanistan, and thanks be to God, I came back uh, with all of my limbs and some of my mind, so I'm just grateful uh, um, that God has kept me and spared me uh, to be here today. Um, again, as everyone has said, I'm here um, to ensure that we implement real change. Um, I was just talking uh, with some of um, my friends, and I was like, hey, uh, we see Wisconsin is controlled solely from the Republican Party. Um, I have a lot of relationships with those who serve in the Democratic Party, um, but no change really can come unless we really embrace and sit down at the table with um, those in the Republican Party because they control pretty much everything except the governor. Um, so um, that's why um, I'm here um, to, to, to say, hey, we, we need this change in our community. I'm here representing black people, and I'm not ashamed of that at all, um, as we, as been stated too, uh, the worst numbers um, is for black people in this state. Um, so I really want to see some intentionality of how we improve the state of African Americans in this state. Um, and also here, um, make sure that uh, we're not just here uh, for meetings, um, but we will see some uh, intimate, uh, immediate change happen from this task force that we're just not here to, uh, I guess, window dressing or a dog and pony show, um, but we actually here um, to talk about critical things, to develop policies and procedures and laws and implement them um, throughout throughout the state. Um, I grew up in Milwaukee, uh, graduated from Milwaukee Tech. Um, at the age of 17 years old, uh, a young white male picked my face out of a yearbook and said I tried to steal his wallet while on the city bus. I was a senior in high school, I got out of school at 9 a.m. each day, and I didn't even ride the bus. I had my own car. Police still came to my house, arrested me, um, took me downtown, and held me for 72 hours. Um, a very traumatizing um, time in my life, and and uh, and that was because I lived in the 53206. Um, if it went out to um, West Bend or someone in Wauwatosa, I don't think that would happen. Um, because of that, I had to take a waiver to join the United States Army because it was on my record. Um, I tried for uh, applied for a concealed carry permit in 2016 and had to get another waiver for that because that was still on my on my on my record. Um, so I understand what it is to um, to live in disparities and also face those challenges. Just this year. Uh, my mom called the Milwaukee Fire Department, called 911. The Milwaukee Fire Department came to her house. She was experiencing shortness of breath. Um, she had fluid on her lungs. She had 103 fever. She had a severe cough and shortness of breath. Uh, the Milwaukee Fire Department went to her house, um, but they didn't transport her to the hospital. Um, and I'm pretty sure it's because of the disparities uh, in where she lived um, that she wasn't given the highest priority for her life. And if she would have stayed in the house one more night, she probably would have died uh, from COVID-19. Um, and so that's why I'm here, um, to speak on behalf of African-American people, um, to speak. Uh, I'm a pastor, so I don't have the liberty of just focusing on one area of people. Uh, we have to focus on so much um, of every aspect of the human being that comes through our doors um, 2017, um, when I was here in Mount Zion, um, a lot of car thefts was going on with our teenagers. And so uh, we brought together um, the city, the county, police, and all the people, social workers that helped. And everyone was trying to come up with major programs to help the youth. But I often say uh, we need to focus on the whole family um, because we can put youth in great programs and they go back into a toxic environment and it change everything that's going on. Um, so my goal for us here is to focus on the entire family, um, education, economics, housing, um, and also uh, mental health. And so I think we definitely need to uh, focus on those things. 
Finally, I, I am a Baptist preacher, and the Bible teaches us um, when Jesus speaks to his people, he told them, when I was naked, did you clothe me? When I was hungry, did you feed me? When I was sick, did you come visit me? When I was in prison, did you come visit me? And uh, their response was, when have we ever seen you this way? He said, when you've done it unto the least of these, um, you've done it unto me. Um, so I, I, I'm uh, um, advocating for the least of these, um, that we would be intentional of, of helping them um, get to um, equitable place uh, in life. Uh, and I know for a fact um, that black people, we're just not looking for handouts. Uh, we just want to hand up uh, that we may be able to uh, be competitive and have the same um, uh, rights to living um, in this state as everyone else. Thank you. Thank you very much, Reverend Dr. Marcus Allen. Next, we'll have President uh, Fred Royal, Milwaukee NAACP. Well, thank you. Uh, I share the same sentiments as uh, have been spoken around this table in this room about the uh, humbleness of being before a bipartisan uh, body to talk about these issues, but unfortunately, they're not new. 1967, the Kerner Commission was uh, formed to talk about the very same things uh, when the riots were occurring across the United States. And unfortunately, the Kerner came, uh, Commission came back and said the issues confronting our nation in the African American community was housing, education, employment, and police community relations. So it's nothing new. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. After uh, Michael Brown was killed in Ferguson, Missouri, a 21st century police task force was assembled. That report was released in 2015. Unfortunately, the community policing uh, division of the Department of Justice was defunded once Jeff Sessions became the Attorney General. That's how you change the culture of a police department. It's already blueprinted. It's already been enacted for five years, best practices in various departments throughout the United States. The people that were on the task force were law enforcement officers and, and academic experts in the field. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. We have to have the willingness to try and change the culture of 141 years of policing in this state that has had a warrior mentality but needs to shift to a guardian mentality. Police accountability. The other thing that 2020 has brought to light, see, there's a, a silver lining in every cloud, is that there's social economic injustices, the disparities in health care, the disparities in who is our frontline essential workers, the disparities in the uh, proximity where people live, the disparities in the biggest thing of all, poverty. Nobody talks about addressing poverty. The city of Milwaukee has an $8.7 billion annually wage exportation. The only city in the state that exports more wages than they bring in. And we talk about there's no economic opportunity. That's a lie. It's a lie folks have been feeding us for the last 40 years, where African Americans have had over 34% poverty rate in the city. There are laws on the books that the state can leverage the city to do what they're supposed to do, as in low-income housing tax credits. There's no way that the city of Milwaukee should be grouped with Waukesha, Ozaki, and Washington County to set the average medium income at $70,000 when the actual average medium income of the city of Milwaukee is $34,000. We should be grouped with Kenosha, Racine, and West Dallas, which would drop the average medium income to $50,000, which would really mean we have affordable housing. Because then, as the guideline states, you can only have a, a percentage of your wages go to rent, which would reduce it from uh, over $1,000 now to $800. That's affordable housing. When we talk about uh, 
tax incremental finance districts. When we see all the development that's occurring in the third ward downtown, there's supposed to be community participation and development agreements attached with that once we give them tax incremental financing that should afford 40% in employment from low and very low income individuals. 25% of the total aggregate of the construction costs should go to minority businesses. 18% of professional services and 18% of procurement should go to minority uh, businesses. If that was fulfilled, we wouldn't have poverty at 34% for 40 years. When Barack Obama came into office, they said, fix the economy. They didn't say, give me a program. Fix housing. Fix the auto industry. And they did it. Reduce, reduce unemployment from 12%. Unemployment for African Americans, males, is over 40%. But yet, we have the highest rate of, of, of eligible employee, uh, males to work, eligible employed, uh, workable uh, males in the state. So why isn't that workforce tapped into? We talk about we have to have education to train the new uh, jobs that come into the economy. But yet, Milwaukee Area Technical College, or excuse me, Bradley, Bradley Tech changes pedagogy. All the, all the trade training facilities, with the exception of the painters, moved out the city. And then there's no adequate transportation. The Joseph Project talks about how they find employment for at-risk or high-risk individuals, but yet Sheboygan is asking for regional transit authority because they got to get those workers to Sheboygan. But they have no funding source. The light rail that was supposed to be from Milwaukee to Waukesha County was, was not allowed to happen and over $300 million or $234 million set in escrow for years until the city split it and the county split it and the city created the hop. And the, and the county bought three uh, gas-powered buses. These are systemic things that can be changed legislatively. If you read the, the color of law, it talks about how government and private industry were complicit in ensuring minorities were marginalized. So we have to be just as complicit in ensuring minorities are included in the economic robust engine of this state. There's a 5% suggested uh, racial equity inclusion in procurement with the state, but it's never been lived up to. These are the things that are low-hanging fruit. So I wanted to talk about what we've been working on at the NAACP, more so than who I am. So thank you. I appreciate your time. Thank you, President Royo. Next, we'll have Rebecca Burrell, Director of Community Impact for United Way of Dane County. <laughs> well, let me say the next thing. It said activist, hair salon, owner, Singer, songwriter. I bet you you have those things. Yes, I am. Okay. I'm an activist. I have been marching with People's Revolution for the past 153 days after um, the George Floyd incident, murder, killing that happened. Um, and in marching with them, I have up close, um, rash truth of what happened during protesting. I have witnessed. Um, protesters who are, were peacefully protesting or nonviolently protesting be tear gassed, um, shot with rubber bullets, brutalized. I was there the night that Alvin Cole's mother, Tracy Cole, was brutalized by police, her and her daughters. Um, I have witnessed National Guard take protesters to Mayfair Mall to detain them. I have witnessed being in Wauwatosa in every um, county sheriff showing up, West Dallas, Brookfield, even Dane County showed up to assist with taking protesters to Mayfair. 
I do have my own organization. It's called Revolution Ready. And Revolution Ready um, amplifies the voice of the community um, and refuses to not be heard. We have a podcast where we talk about issues that go on in our community. Uh, we are also an organization that is working towards the dismantling of systematic racism as well as black liberation. I stand here proud as a black woman. I see the disparities. I will not sugarcoat anything. I want to get to the meat of what's going on. I'm grateful to be here. I thank you for the invitation and for the time that you spent here, each and every person that is here. If we don't come to a solution soon, we may never have another chance. I have been out on the street trying to mediate between police and the community. I have stopped things that could have happened that did not happen. Had myself or other people who are interveners had not been there. I'm telling you, if we don't get to the meat of things, then we will never have another chance. America as we know it will never be the same. I've also had instances and occurrences of racism as a child. I grew up in a Lutheran church. The church that I went to was a black church, Garden Homes Lutheran Church. The sister churches, the other Wells churches, were racist. They would call us all kind of N-words. They would call us B-words. So I've witnessed that at a young age. I've also witnessed it in child care. My mother has her own daycare. She's had it for 17 years. I've witnessed how the state licensor has come in, and my mother had to do twice the work in order to keep her business running to continue to take care of her family. I've witnessed racism and, pull, and being pulled over and asked, what are you doing here? As if I was not a citizen of America. I've witnessed racism on um, the school education level. I worked in that third grade class that had to pass those tests. And if they didn't pass those tests, we could be guaranteed that they would have a spot in prison. I have been under that pressure to make sure that they pass those tests. I have been in Keith Avenue School in the 06 area code, and I've seen the disparities that are raging in that school. I've witnessed um, the racism and the disparities in the high schools. I had a program, I have a program, it's called Crowning Legacy, it's where we teach entrepreneurship to teens and life skills. So I went from school to school in partnership with Boys and Girls Club um, that was not funded for my program that I did voluntarily because I couldn't get the funding that I needed for my program in order to teach um, these programs. But I went on and did the program anyway to teach um, teenagers how to find themselves and how to rely on their own skills and gifts as opposed to relying on the government to take care of them. Um, one thing that I'm also pressing for in my organization is to end qualified immunity for officers and for reparations for black people because, no, we don't need a handout, but we did help to build this country. And if my grandfather had gotten, my great-great-grandfather had gotten the reparations that was owed him, that they said that they would give him, I would probably be a billionaire by now. So thank you for having me here. I appreciate the space, and I hope that we actually come to some type of solution. Thank you so much, Ms. Farrell. We will make sure that we correct uh, your titles. We do have it as, at the subcommittee level, but we will refine that. So thank you so much for your comments. Um, Marty Caldron, a God Touch Ministry. God Touch Milwaukee Ministries. So God Touch Milwaukee yeah, Ministries. We'll edit that other ones too. Out there, so. um, you know, it's a blessing to be here and to be in a group of people that I really don't know. Um, but maybe a couple of you. Um, so I came here with an open mind. Um, I've dealt with a lot of issues. I was I grew up on 12th and Madison on the south side of Milwaukee. And at the age of 15, my dad moved me out to Oconomowoc, Wisconsin. And being the only Latino besides my sister in the middle school, um, let's just say I, I dealt with some racist things. And But I didn't let it stop me. That's the one thing I did, that I never did. And I wasn't going to let anything hold me back from what I was called to do. And that was to serve people and help people. And that's why I'm doing what I'm doing, is working with men who are coming out of prison. I have four homes, and we just bought a church. And we are, we are working with them to be able to be successful. 
and we've seen the men coming out of our organization, being able to go back into their population, to their community, and serve the community. So we're getting guys who are coming out of prison, out of jails, right back into the neighborhood. And we're seeing them succeed with employment, not temp jobs. We're talking career jobs. And we're able to get some of them in school. We're able to to get them back on their feet to provide we work with the House of Correction. I've done a program with them that has never been done before where they allowed us to house guys who were on a um, work release program. So 10, 10 guys that we received, that came through our program have not gone back to jail. So we're, we're doing something right, you know. And um, I, hear, I hear you, okay? I really do. And this is one of the reasons why I wanted to be in this group because I want to learn more and understand it a little bit more and deeper. I've been invited to go protest, but I've never done it. I know people, some of the people who are the organizers. Um, but what I want to bring to this table, into this group, is an open mind to, to make sure there is going to be change. As the pastor said, I don't want to be in a group where we're just here to meet. And be a ponytail. Uh, what did you say? A dog and pony show. Because mm -hmm. if that's the case, I don't, I've been in those meetings before, and I've learned not to go back. Because I want to make sure that there's going to be structure, there's going to be accountability with all of us. If we say we're going to do something, we do it. You know, I think that that's been left out in a whole lot of stuff. You know, I've done a lot of work with the gangs on the south side, sat with a lot of the leaders on the gangs on the south side. And we did mediations with law enforcement also where so many gangs felt they were being treated unfairly. And we sat with captains of the law enforcement and, and were able to come to a, an agreement, what they say, agree to disagree on certain things. But we were willing to take that step and do it. Um, and we were able to hold people accountable. And I think holding people accountable in their structure will bring that change. I think somehow that structure was broke, and it's time that we hold one another accountable in what we're doing. If it's in the different callings that we have, which we all do, you know, it's like, I don't want to get too spiritual, but it's like the body of Christ, okay? In the body, we all have different parts. But with all the different parts, we could bring it together and make it work, which we could do as we're going to be doing here in so I guess I, I, I really, I just want to be able to voice my, be a voice for the ones who aren't sitting in this circle and go back to, to them and tell them change is coming, you know. And I think as um, Representative Seneke said that when we do have a package, when that package goes to legislation, I hope that there will be change with it because if not, then why were we all here? So I think there needs to be an open mind with the legislation, too. As you guys will rep be representatives for us when you sit with them. Because people want change. Mm -hmm. People want to live in a safe environment. And people want to be able to raise their kids in a good environment to where they're not going to feel judged. So however I can help out, I'm here. Thank you, Mr. Calderon. Next we have Dr. Jeremiah Holliday, Chief Academic Officer at Milwaukee Public Schools. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jeremiah Holliday, Chief Academic Officer of Milwaukee Public Schools. I am truly appreciative of the opportunity to collaborate and be a thought partner at this table to address the significant racial disparities plaguing our communities here in Wisconsin. Given my lifelong career as an educator, of course, my passion and focus are related to how we provide the best possible education and learning experience to every student. Yes, in our students with disabilities. Yes, our First Nation students. Yes, our English language learners as well. Of course, given the educational data that we are all familiar with, we know this isn't happening. In particular, we know there are deep and persistent racial opportunity and access gaps in our state schools. I'm excited to 
uh, the, for the potential of this task force and the many community leaders that are a part of this group because I believe that it's the community that will help us to change the trajectory uh, we are on both in education and all of the other sectors of our society, including uh, policing, health care, housing, employment, and poverty, and many other things. All of this is an equity issue. And I constantly ask myself as a refined educator of 26 years, are we ensuring people, children, families, and communities are receiving what they need to thrive, to provide, and to prosper? I, too, am a uh, person that grew up in the South, in Mississippi, and everything that you've heard, believe it. It is absolutely imperative that we all see ourselves as part of the solution and people who through this task force can evoke action, action at all parts of our systems. So thank you, Representatives Steinecke and Stubbs, uh, for your leadership and for the invitation to serve on this task force. Thank you for the intentionality of ensuring the critical voices of all diverse communities in Wisconsin are elevated. I look forward to what I know will be tough but robust conversations on how we can build trust, repair, as well as address the racial inequities in our state. As a father of four beautiful black children, I am certainly optim optimistic as a member of this task force. I expect and look forward to advancing thoughtful, equity-based recommendations and plans of action to speak of us and the Wisconsin legislature that will move us forward ultimate uh, service to providing a quality education to all of uh, our children. So we just not focus on it's about meritocracy, but who's going to give you the opportunity of having that first job? And how do we begin to advance the work to make sure we're meeting the needs of our communities? Again, thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Holliday. And our last speaker is Veronica King, Gateway Technical College instructor, former Department of Corrections social worker. Good, a good afternoon. Good I want to thank uh, both of our representatives for allowing me the opportunity to serve on this task force. Um, a little background about myself. I've uh, actually been a licensed social worker, substance abuse counselor, and a clinical supervisor all uh, licensed here in Wisconsin. Um, I've worked for the last 30 plus years with the offender population, both juveniles and adults, male and females, in the correctional setting, outside of the correctional setting. And I currently work with substance use disorder uh, individuals. Uh, I currently uh, teach as an adjunct instructor at Gateway Technical College in the traffic safety program. So I work with uh, offenders uh, who have uh, first time offenders with OWI offenses. Um, so I've worked with uh, civil rights organizations through the years. Uh, I'm the past president of the Kenosha NAACP. Um, I currently serve as vice president of Congregations United to Serve Humanity which is our faith-based organization under the wisdom, as a wisdom affiliate in the Kenosha area. And I currently serve on the Sex Offender Residency Board for the city of Kenosha. Uh, so I've studied criminal justice at the bachelor level, master's level, and I just completed my dissertation for a PhD in criminal justice. So I plan to bring the research and the data to the task force and assist with uh, any information we need with regards to uh, racial disparities in uh, health care, employment, uh, policing, uh, and uh, work with the, uh, any decisions we make with regards to juvenile justice as well. So I thank you for the opportunity 
uh, to serve on this committee, and I look forward to working with each of you. Thank you. Oh, sorry. <laughs> we both thank you. Yeah, How about that? Thank you. <laughs> um, so I, I hope over the last hour and a half, hour and 45 minutes as we've uh, gone through these introductions, it gives all of you a sense of why mm -hmm. we're so excited about this task force and the opportunities that we have uh, to work within it to really come up with some uh, solutions to the issues that are out there. I mean, the, I, I, again, I couldn't be prouder of uh, the composition of the task force, the members, the, the willingness uh, to set everything aside, to come up with solutions, uh, to uh, Reverend Allen's position or your, your statement about a dog and pony show, I can assure you, sir, um, I wouldn't be here if that were the case. Uh, if we weren't serious about this, um, I, w I wouldn't have put my name on it. So we are we are here to get some uh, serious work done, uh, again, together, uh, and hopefully with with consensus because that's where we're gonna we're gonna make the biggest impact. So just uh, a couple of things uh, uh, before we wrap up. Uh, Subcommittees, uh, I think we've talked to all of you about subcommittees uh, coming out of this. There will be two subcommittees, one on uh, law enforcement policies and procedures and one on education and economic development. Um, main reason for those two uh, sides of the issue is obviously the, the disparities exist in a, in a lot of different areas. Um, if we had tried to tackle that as an entire task force, uh, I really, uh, I think we feared that we would lose some of the momentum. We could, you know, we could start off with uh, law enforcement issues, pass a package, but then to restart the the process over again after that would would be challenging, I think, to say the least. So that that's really the reason for two separate uh, subcommittees, so we can take parallel tracks um, and hopefully have legislation to introduce in in all of these different areas uh, after the first of the year. Um, we expect those uh, those subcommittees to uh, the details on the membership to be released soon. But when we have those subcommittee meetings, we will be doing them in person. Uh, the challenge with this large of a group uh, is um, just the size of the room. We we just didn't have a room where we could have uh, thirty plus people in it at one time. But once we break into subcommittees, it'll be easier to manage. Um, as far as the schedule going uh, goes, we will be getting that information out to you as soon as we can via email. Um, the first uh, meeting of each subcommittee we're, we're hoping will be within uh, a couple of weeks, uh, probably the week after the election. Um, and there's a possibility going forward that uh, not all the probability going forward that not all the meetings will be held in Madison. Uh, we are going to try to get around to different parts of the state just so we can bring more people into this conversation uh, and do a better job of educating the entire state as to what the issues are and, and what the solutions should be. Um, but that doesn't mean if, if you're on one subcommittee versus the other, uh, we encourage you to participate in both. Uh, so we'll try to make the schedule as uh, uh, conducive to that as possible so that if there is one subcommittee meeting going on, um, that you'll have the opportunity to either attend or testify at a different subcommittee. Um, so, you know, don't take an assignment as, as the end of the process when it comes to the other uh, subcommittee and not what the work they're going to be doing. Uh, we're all going to be working on this together. And the, the idea is that at the end of this, um, well, hopefully, there's, hopefully this is a continuing conversation so it's not, there's not a defined end. Um, but at, at any point where we're coming back together to re recommend legislation, we will do that as an entire group. Uh, so I would encourage you to keep tabs on what's going on in, in both uh, of the subcommittees. Um, again, uh, verify your, uh, please verify your, your getting the emails and the information as we go forward. Uh, and if you have any issues with attendance at any of these meetings, please let us know. Uh, for those of you today that were in person, uh, we'll be emailing out uh, mileage reimbursement forms. Uh, so please fill those out so you can be appropriately compensated for the, the travel. 
Um, and then for those that are virtual uh, in the future, we'll be sending out those mileage reimbursement forms as well for wherever we go. So um, really the idea is to get into the different corners of the state. Uh, most of the meetings taking place here, but uh, again, we want to include as many people in this conversation as we can. So Representative Stubbs, do you have anything to follow up with? Oh, first, thank you to everyone for being here. Also, as we identified you, if there was information incorrect, please let us know. Bob will make sure that we refine it. We want to make sure that we are accurately addressing you in your correct title. I know Dr. Allen, we forgot to put doctor with yours, so we want to make sure we do that. Um, Rebecca, we definitely want to go back and readjust yours. Um, and I caught uh, Marty. Uh, we want to make sure we include Milwaukee with yours. So when you look, I mean, uh, just make sure you check in with Bob because um, I, I believe, first of all, we want to address you correctly. And um, again, thank you for your time and your commitment. Um, that's all I have to add. Perfect. So were there any questions from anybody virtually or in person about uh, the process, how this is going to work, or, or anything like that that we can answer right off the bat? We'll give people virtually a chance to raise their hand. We got anybody? One person? This is why we're going to do everything in person. <laughs> Pam Holmes. Yeah, yeah, so, so I would, it, it, it's, it's going to probably depend on where the meetings are and, you know, just how many people we have testifying. But uh, we typically, at least personally, I, I prefer to do it in a half a day so we don't go over lunch or dinner hours. Um, so I would I would assume either, you know, if the meeting's in the morning, it'd be like a, an 8 to noon. If it's in the afternoon, it'd probably be like a noon to 4 or 1 to 5, something like that. Do you have anybody else? Okay, we're just checking to see if anybody virtually is popping up. Nope, we're good. Okay, so with that, please uh, keep an eye on your emails. We'll have information out hopefully within a, a, a day or two on a subsequent meeting and the task for the subcommittee uh, assignments and all that uh, information. So... And also, please feel free to get in contact with us anytime during this process, especially if you have questions, um, but also if you have concerns, uh, really, about the process. We want this to be open and honest, and if anybody feels at any time that uh, they're not being allowed to be heard or if there's concerns, let us know. Um, because this is, like I said, something we're... we're really excited about and I, I think we have great opportunities here as as long as we uh, keep the lines of communication open so if there's nothing else i think we would stand adjourned thanks everybody thank you this program is a production of wisconsin eye an independent nonpartisan, nonprofit media network with a mission to inform educate and engage the citizens of wisconsin Wisconsin Eye is the nation's first and only independently funded state civics broadcast network, providing gavel-to-gavel -gavel access to government proceedings and events at the state capitol.